Morning. 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 As you can tell, it's that time of year again. It's it's uh, the month of October where we uh, have traditionally uh, taken up the Georgia Barnett uh, offering. Uh, this one is unique. It's a uh, it's one uh, that that deals directly with us as a as a state. It's it's for it's for mission work to be done right here at home. And so uh, some some may be hesitant to want to to give to other offerings that 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 don't address things locally but this is one that does and so uh, we've learned uh, through trial and error uh, in the past that uh, when we don't just set one single day uh, to take up an offering uh, we get a better response and so the whole month of October we'll be taking up uh, this offering and so the envelopes are on the table in the back just grab one and uh, just prayerfully give as the Lord leads and whenever you I know some can't give on this day or, or next week, whenever you can, uh, based off of your circumstances, just uh, uh, give as the Lord leads. And then let's, let's ask God to, to bless uh, the, the offering this year and that His Word will go forth. And, and some of the ministries that, that we'll see, we're going to watch videos each Sunday morning, uh, you'll see disaster relief, right? That's the, we, we know what a blessing that can be, and, and other parts of our state have been, a bless, uh, been benefited by a disaster relief, but also church planning, church revitalizations, all those things. And as you saw in the video, that here for you is a, is a, a social media uh, a, a ministry where people can ask, ask questions and have their concerns answered and stuff like that. So there's lots of uh, things that are being done, lots of good things, positive things that are being done uh, with our giving when we support the Georgia Barnett uh, offering. And so I just encourage you to prayerfully consider how the Lord would have you to give uh, again uh, this year. So uh, open your Bibles uh, now if you have them with you to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to be at uh, this morning. I'm calling this morning's message, Thy Kingdom Come. Um, I've been here seven years, and, and most of you would know that I'm not much of a, 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 a end times guy. Some some people like to talk about uh, end time prophecies and, and, and really get into the book of Revelation, and uh, I, I haven't done that. I haven't been one of those type of individuals. And it's not that I don't know or that I don't, that I don't understand or uh, I don't believe uh, in those prophecies. I do. I understand. I believe all those things. I know what's going to happen. I know what to expect and, and I know what's coming. But more important than that, I know who is coming. Amen. Right? I know who is coming and that's the, the most important thing of all. But with all of the chaos and all the craziness and all the things that we're dealing with these days, the, all the confusion that's out there, and I'm, I'm starting to, to think more and more about the return of Christ and some of you are too. Right? I, I hear more now than maybe ever, you know, come Lord Jesus, that people are saying because of things are, are degrading rather quickly. And so we think about what's happening and we see in our culture all of the, the perversion, the, 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 the open perversion of, of things and the way, just the, the way uh, wicked things, sinful things, just disgusting things have, have been, have become accepted as normal. Right, that, that we're just, that this is the way things are now, and we're to be okay with it. That's simply not true. I've been thinking more and more about Christ's return. I've been thinking more and more about end times. You see, but I don't want to be caught without all in my lamp. Right? And you shouldn't want to be caught that way either. And God's Word tells us that Jesus is coming back, and He's coming back like a thief in the night. Right? Uh, at, at a time that we do not expect. That's what Matthew 24, 44 tells us. And I can't say with any degree of certainty that Christ is coming back tomorrow or next week or next month or, or next year, right? None of us can do that. None of us can, can know those things. But I can say with certainty that He is coming back. Amen. I know this. His Word tells us that He is coming back. I can say with certainty that we are one day closer to Christ's return today than we were yesterday. Right. I can say that. I can say with certainty that we are one day closer to the kingdom of God coming today than we were yesterday. And that's exciting. That is very exciting. That, that is encouraging to me in these dark days. 
You see, here's the fact of the matter. The kingdom of God is coming whether we are ready for it to come or not. Right. Ready or not, here I come. Amen. Is what Jesus is wanting us to know this morning. Now most of most, if not all of us in this room would say that they are ready for that to happen. Right? I'm ready. I'm ready. Any day, I'm ready for him to come back. And listen to me. I hope that's true. I hope that you're that that you are being honest about that. And I hope that you are in fact ready. But you see, some people aren't ready. Even people that say they're ready aren't ready. Only those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ are ready for him to come back. That's right. That's the only ones that are, are, are ready. If you haven't repented of your sins, if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, you're not ready for him to come back. But here's the good news. You can be ready. That's right. You can be made ready today. Romans 10, 9 and 10 and 13 tell us how that we can be made ready. We must be saved. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then verse 13 seals, he says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever means whoever. Anyone and everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That this great salvation, this eternal kingdom of God are available to all people, anyone and everyone. Anyone and everyone, no one is beyond this gift of grace, this great salvation. So some would ask when, you, when, we, when we, we share the gospel and we say, well, you need to get saved. The, the, their question is this, what do I need to get saved from? What do you mean I need to get saved? Now, that's a good question. I had that same question when someone told me that. But Mike, you need to get saved. And I say, great, what do I need to get saved from? I didn't understand. We need, need to get saved from the power and the penalty of our sins. Mm -hmm. sure. The condemnation that we deserve because of our sin, the wages of sin is death. Our sins condemned us to hell and separated us from God. That's what we need to be saved from. But the good news is Jesus took that condemnation for us. Mm -hmm. That's what the cross is about. He took our the condemnation that we deserved with his work on the cross so that we could be forgiven and now we can be reconciled back to God. And so my question for you is if, if you're not ready, would you be made ready today? See, my question is, would you be saved today? I'm, not, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you came to church. But you see, just coming to church isn't, isn't good enough. That doesn't cut it. You need to be right with God. You need to be saved from the power and the penalty of your sins. You see, the only reason that Jesus came down from heaven in the first place was to save sinners. Mm -hmm. It was. Luke 19.10 tells us that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Which brings another question we think about his purpose. Right? Who, who was he coming for? Who, who was lost? Let me just keep it simple for you. Everyone. That's right. Everyone was lost. Everyone was lost because everyone has committed sins. Everyone has been separated from God. Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. None means none. No, there are no good people. Right? Let, let's, just, let's just get that out of the way. Everybody says, well, this, he's a good man or he's a good woman. He's a, he's a good person. She's a good person. There are no good people. Not, not according to God's standards. Maybe from human to human, from one bad person to another bad person, yes. We can say, well, there that's a good person compared to someone else. But God's standard, there is none righteous, there are none good. You see, we know that Jesus wanted the kingdom to come because he said it when in, in what we know as the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 16 and, and Luke 12, he said, Thy kingdom come, right? He, he wanted the, 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 the kingdom of God to come to come and to change things and to, for people to be welcomed in. But you see, there's a, there's a pretty significant problem, you see, with this kingdom. Only righteous people can enter into God's kingdom. That's right. you, you can't just enter in because you want to enter in. You must come His way. You must be righteous to enter into His kingdom. And so this morning, I want us to think about the present and future implications of the kingdom that is coming for both the saved and the 
unsaved among us. And for us to do that, let's look at God's Word. Let's stand together. Let's stand together in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus walked by the sea of Galilee and saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching in the preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. This is God's Word. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for the promise that, that your kingdom is coming. Father, we are excited about this truth. And Father, today I, I pray that, that we are encouraged from your word, that we are reminded of the, the role that we play in your kingdom coming, the kingdom work that you have for us to do as we look to Jesus and, and his example. And Father, that we would be faithful to, to be and to do all that you have called us to be and to do as we make things ready for your kingdom to come. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. And the first thing that we see in our passage is the mission of the kingdom. The mission of the kingdom. Our, our passage opens with word getting back to Jesus that his cousin had been put in prison. His, his, his cousin is John the Baptist. Right? That, uh, that, that Herod would, would have him arrested and would have him executed because he made a a promise to his stepdaughter. Right? He, he, up, whatever you ask for, he says, you know, she's dancing for them and all. And whatever, up to half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. And she went to her mother, and her mother says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And so he had to, to keep his word. And so John the Baptist has been arrested. Uh, we, we know that, that John was a, a man with a mission, that his mission was to make the pathway straight. He was the one that would herald. He was the one that was saying that the Messiah is coming, that, that God promised to send, the, the promised one is coming. He was the one that was crying out in the wilderness. He had a mission. John was quite the character from what we can tell. He he looked the part of a prophet. Right? He looked, I, I kind of picture him as kind of looking like a wild man. Right? The, the, the camel hair cloth and uh, eating locusts and, and honey and just kind of a, a brash individual, right? He, 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 didn't, he didn't care. He was quite bold. He was very outspoken. Uh, he had, the, he had the, 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 the bravado and the, and the, uh, uh, the temperament of a, a prophet that we saw throughout the Old Testament. You see, what, what John would do is he called things like he saw it. He called a spade a spade. He, it didn't matter. When he saw sin... He called it out, even when he saw it in the religious leaders. He, he wasn't very popular with them, as you can imagine. Right? He, remember he called them a den of vipers. He, he, he told, who told you to flee from the judgment that is to come? He, he wasn't very on, on good terms with them, but yet 
massive crowds were coming out into the desert to hear him preach, and they were confessing their sins, and they were being baptized by him, many of them even believed that he was the Messiah, right? that he was the one that the scriptures had foretold, but he was quick to correct them when he heard these things. Matthew 3.11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. At this point, John had accomplished his mission. He had done what God had, had called him to do. He had served his purpose, and now his time was coming to an end. That he had prepared the way for Jesus by calling the people of God to repentance. He pointed everyone to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, I think that, that's basically what Jesus' mission statement was, right? We, everybody likes to have mission statements. Businesses have mission statements. Churches have mission statements. And that would be a good one for Jesus, that he came to take away the sins of the world. And so what exactly was the mission of Jesus? What was his mission? Right? It was to take away the sins of the world. It was to bring light to the darkness. It was to bring the gospel to who? All people. That's right. The good news to, to all people. You see, Jesus didn't just give us the Great Commission. He's the one who started it. Right? He's the one who got the ball rolling as the saying goes. And now after hearing of John's arrest, Jesus left Nazareth to go and begin to preach and make disciples down by the sea at Capernaum. More specifically, the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. And you see, this wasn't no accident. This wasn't random. He didn't just kind of I wonder where I'm going to go. Where, where should I begin? He, he was fulfilling Scripture. He was fulfilling Scripture. Everything that Jesus said and did was intentional. It always had purpose. In verses 15 and 16, what they are, there's a quote from Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. He says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. You see, church, Jesus is the light of the world. That's right. He is. He is the light of the world. He is the great light that Isaiah wrote about. <clears throat> the people had grown comfortable sitting in darkness. What kind of darkness was this? This was, doesn't mean it, was, it wasn't like this, like there was no light. They were sitting in spiritual darkness. In spiritual darkness, they had grown comfortable in their sins and in their condemnation. They had grown comfortable living in the shadow of death. There was no fear anymore. There was no conviction. They were lost and wandering without hope. You see, Jesus came to bring light to the darkness. He came to bring light to the darkness. The Apostle John described Jesus being the light this way in his opening uh, verses of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In John 8, 12, Jesus made this declaration about Himself. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You see, if you have Jesus, you have the light of life. If you have Jesus, you have the light of life, which means you have been fully forgiven. You have been fully reconciled with God. You have eternal life. You see, this is good news. This is good news for you. Really good news. But if you don't have Jesus, guess what? The opposite is true. You are still in darkness. You are still in darkness, which means that you are condemned in your sins. You are still separated from God, and that is terrible news. Absolutely tragic news, to be honest. But here's more good news. 1 Timothy 1.15 tells us that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus came into the world for someone just like you. If you, you, you have not yet believed in Jesus, He came into the world just for you so that you could be saved. You see, if saving sinners was important to Jesus, it should be important to us as His church. 
If saving sinners was important to Jesus, it should be important to you and I. The mission of the kingdom was important to Jesus. It should be, it should be important to us as well. The mission of the kingdom is to bring light to the darkness. Amen? Amen. That's the mission of the kingdom. The second thing that we see in our passage is the message of the kingdom. The message of the kingdom. What, when we think about the message of the kingdom, what, what is the, our message to our community? Right when we, when we engage people in our community, it could be a family member or a friend or a complete stranger, someone in our community, and we're trying to, to witness them. What is our, our message? Or, or are we telling them that they need to try to be better people? They need to do more good stuff than bad? To, to, to try harder to, to please God? Or do we just tell them that, hey, you really should come to church. You should, you should come to church, and, and then maybe you'll be a better person if you come to church more? Do we tell them that Jesus loves them and accepts them just like they are? They don't need to change anything, right? That's what we'll tell them because we don't want to stir things up. We don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, you see. But none of these things are true. None of these things are accurate. Our message to our community should be the same message that Jesus had for his community. We should be telling people the same things that Jesus was telling people whenever he walked the earth. What was Jesus' message, verse 17, tells us. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's right. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, Jesus' message is the message of the kingdom. To repent means to stop. That's what it means. It means to stop what you're doing and turn away from it. It doesn't, it doesn't say to just feel bad about it. Right? Don't, don't, don't just feel bad about your sins. Don't just cry about your sins. Right? Stop. That's what it means to repent. Stop and turn away from your sins. To, to head in the opposite direction. The message of the kingdom to lost sinners is to repent of any and all sin. To stop and turn away from sexual immorality. To stop and turn away from lust and idolatry. To stop and turn away from greed and self-centeredness, to stop and turn away from gossip and slander. And I can go on and on and on, but you get the point. Stop and turn away. Simply put, to repent means to stop and turn away from anything that God's Word calls sin. But you see, there's more to repenting than stopping and turning away from sin. There's more to it. There's more. True repentance happens when we turn away from our sin and turn towards King Jesus. That's right. So it's not just turning away from sin, it's turning to someone else, something else. King Jesus in this case. True repentance is more than taking something away from your life. True repentance requires that we replace what was taken away with Jesus. When we turn away from our sins and towards King Jesus, He takes away our sins and replaces them with him with his perfect righteousness. He takes away our fears and anxieties and replaces them with his perfect peace. He takes away our hopelessness and replaces it with a living hope. In fact, when we, we truly return from our sins, we are made new in every possible way. Every possible way. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what has become new for you if you are in Christ? Everything. Everything has become new. You see, nobody can hear, nobody can enter the kingdom without becoming a new creation. Right? Nobody can. It doesn't work that way. The only way to become a new creation is by repenting from turning away from your sins and then turning towards King Jesus by believing in Him in His finished work on the cross. And Jesus' message to the people He encountered in Capernaum was to repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. You see, Jesus is the King of heaven. And therefore, the kingdom of heaven was in fact at hand. When He walked the earth, the kingdom was at hand. The king of heaven was there. He was walking. He was breathing. He was living amongst them. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. And he was calling people to repent of their sins and to believe in him. 
And guess what? Our message is still the same today. Right? It's the same. Nothing has changed. Our message is the same. The message of the kingdom is to repent, to turn away from your sins and turn towards King Jesus. The third thing that we see in our passage is the messengers of the kingdom. The messengers of the kingdom. One of the most common things I hear from people that aren't actively sharing their faith, that, that aren't evangelizing, aren't witnessing, aren't sharing the gospel with others is they would tell me that they don't feel like they're qualified. That they're not qualified to, to do this, to, to share the good news. They'll say that, you know, they'll say, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a preacher, I'm not an evangelist. They'll tell me and make it plain that I'm just ordinary. I'm just an ordinary Christian. I'm just an ordinary follower of Jesus. And I said, okay, that, that makes sense. And I, I, I mean, does, does God use pastors, preachers, and evangelists to proclaim this message? Sure. That's what I'm doing right now this morning, right? I'd also ask, does God use ordinary followers of Jesus to proclaim this message? The answer is yes. Absolutely yes. You see, Jesus didn't head into the to head to the synagogues to call his first disciples, did he? He, he didn't, he, if he was alive today and, and, and turned things around, and he, he didn't come into the church. He, he didn't come to, to, to where you think he would go to find people. He didn't go looking for the most theologically qualified men he could find. No, instead Jesus went to the seashore to call his first disciples. What was he doing there? Why, why would he go there? Why, is he, why would he go to the Sea of Galilee? Why would he go to this, this little small uh, fishing village, this community, to, to call his first disciples? I believe he went there because he was looking for ordinary people. Ordinary people. Someone that he could use. People that would listen to him. Ordinary people is just what he found. He called two sets of brothers. He called two sets of ordinary fishermen. Who would have figured Right? Who would have figured? Starting in verse 18, he says, Then Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. There have been a whole lot of sermons preached from these verses, I can imagine. Uh, pastors have found creative ways to spiritualize casting and mending nets. I could do it. I, I just, as I was working through this preparing, I said, I, I, I could really spin these. I could really use these analogies. Think of casting a net as a metaphor for sharing the gospel, because that's what we're doing, right? It's like, it's like fishing. We're casting a net with the gospel. We must cast the gospel net into the sea of lostness. Right? You, you may have heard something similar to this before. Or maybe mending our nets is a metaphor to, uh, to, to make sure that we keep our doctrine sound and make sure that the gospel that we proclaim is pure, that it doesn't have any holes in it. But you see, is that what, is that what God really wants us to, to think about from this passage? Is that really what he wants us to focus on in these verses? You see, these verses aren't primarily about fishing at all. These verses are primarily about following Jesus. That's right. They're about following him. These were four ordinary men that were willing to leave everything to follow Jesus. Verse 20 said that Peter and Andrew immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. Verse 22 said that James and John immediately left their boat and their father and followed Jesus. In other words, they were obedient. They were obedient. They were ordinary and they were obedient. You're looking for two characteristics of, of, of messengers, the people that God will use, ordinary and obedient. Ordinary and obedient. Jesus wasn't just calling these four men to be his disciples. He was calling them to be kingdom messengers. Kingdom messengers to be heralds of the good news, heralds of the gospel. If you have repented of your sins and believed in King Jesus, guess what? You are a kingdom messenger too. That's, right. that's, that's who you are. That is part of your assignment. That's your calling. You are a herald of the gospel. More than that, the Apostle Paul calls you an ambassador of the kingdom. 
2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, kingdom messengers are tasked with sharing the message of the kingdom. That's what we do. That's our, our calling. That's our charge. You see, God doesn't need us to be extraordinary messengers. God just needs us to be obedient messengers. Right? You, ain't gotta, you don't have to be a, a, a super articulate, very well spoken, very passionate, all these things. No, you just need to be obedient to what God has called you to do. He has given us His message. I appreciate the way that David Platt explained the impact of that these first uh, disciples made on the world. He said this, he said, human history was altered forever by this group of disciples. And it began with four local fishermen, hardly a world-changing task force. But this is the beauty of God's design, namely to take weak and lowly sinners and enable them to do far more than they could ever imagine. All the praise of his glorious grace. May he use us and our churches to change our world today. And to that I say amen. I say amen. The messengers of the kingdom are just ordinary and obedient people just like you and me. The fourth and final thing that we see in our passage is the ministries of the kingdom. The ministries of the kingdom. Sometimes I think we get the ministries of the kingdom and the mission of the kingdom confused. We, we get them confused or, or, or we think that they're the same thing and they're, they're not. The mission of the kingdom is to bring light to the darkness, to offer people hope and life through repentance and belief in Jesus and His work on the cross. The ministries of the kingdom are the means that God has given to His people to accomplish the mission. Right? We, we, we do ministry to accomplish the mission. The goal of every ministry of our church is to accomplish the mission. Everything we do here should be geared towards accomplishing the mission of the kingdom. We don't just meet to be meeting as some would suppose. Right? Some think that. Like, it doesn't really matter. We're just meeting because it's Sunday or we're meeting because it's Wednesday or, or whatever. We're just doing that out just, because, just because. No, we're meeting because we're trying to accomplish the mission. Right? The, right. The, the, we gather as a church. Uh, there's ministry happening here to accomplish the mission. We don't just pray to be praying. We don't just have Sunday school to have Sunday school. We don't just have discipleship to have discipleship. All of these things, all these ministries of our church are geared towards us accomplishing the mission. That's right. We're not just here because we don't have anything better to do, as some would suppose. We're here for a reason. We're trying to accomplish the mission. The goal of every ministry of our church is intended to either reach people with the gospel of Christ, help believers become more and more like Christ, or to let people experience the love of Christ through meeting their needs. That's the purpose of the ministries of our church. We're not just doing this because we don't have anything better to do. The ministries of the kingdom are about reaching people like Jesus did. Verse 23 tells us that Jesus went about all Galilee. Verse 24 tells us that Jesus went throughout all Syria. And as a result of Jesus reaching people where they were, verse 25 tells us that great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And so for us, as we think about Jesus as our example, how did Jesus reach people? He went. He went to people. He, he met them where they were. But he also had three other ways. First, that Jesus reached people through his teaching ministry. Verse 23 begins by telling us that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Right? The, the message of the kingdom, the, the gospel was to be given to the Jews first. But if you're familiar with your Bibles, we know that they rejected that message. And that message was able to move on beyond the Jews and began to be shared with the Gentiles. And that's the reason that Occupy 2 exists on the other side of the planet some 2,000 years later. We know from other passages in the Gospels that Jesus often taught in, 
informal settings. He taught around campfires. He taught in people's homes. He, he, he taught as he walked along with the disciples, sharing stories and, 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 and parables and all these teachings. That Jesus was always teaching either with his words or with his example. And so what exactly did Jesus teach? Because that's important too, right? We need to know that. He was teaching the Word of God. That's what He was teaching. The Word of God. Giving the Word of God. How, how do we bring light to the darkness? By teaching God's Word. Right? By teaching God's Word. The same thing that Jesus did. People don't need to hear our opinions. People need to hear God's Word. That's what people need to hear. Secondly... Jesus reached people through his preaching ministry. Verse 23 tells us that Jesus went about all of Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was pleading with the people to turn from their sins and to believe in him. See, that, that preaching and teaching isn't the same thing. They're similar, but they're not the same. Right? The, the focus of teaching ministry is to explain the truth of God's word, to have a right understanding of God's Word, to be sound in our understanding, to be sound in our doctrine. That's the primary focus of, of teaching. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the preaching is different. It's a little, a little, a little more nuanced to it. The focus of preaching ministry is to transform someone's life through the power of God's proclaimed word. Every time the, the word of God is preached, every time the word of God is proclaimed, power is released. The power of God's word goes forth. When, when God's word is proclaimed, promises are released and strongholds come down. When God's word is proclaimed, sins get exposed and the prideful get humbled. But most important of all, when the gospel of the kingdom is preached from God's word, people get right with God. Amen. People get right with God. We can't always explain why it happened or how it happened. We don't know. It's a work of the spirit. But when God's word is proclaimed, when God's word is preached, power goes forth. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 1, 16 tells us that the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So the question is, what did Jesus preach? What did he preach? He, he preached the word of God. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. How, how do we bring light to the darkness, church? How do we do this? We do this by preaching the word of God and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, just like Jesus did. Doing the same things that Jesus did. Thirdly, Jesus reached people through his healing ministry. Verse 23 tells us that Jesus healed all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people of Galilee. Verse 24 tells us that they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. You see, Jesus' healing ministry was a miracle-working ministry. And sometimes that's what we get, we, we kind of get thrown off by, by that because we look at what Jesus did and we'll say, well, that's, that's what Jesus did. And Jesus worked miracles. And we, we, we know that we can't, we, we, we in ourselves, our own strength, our own power, we can't, we don't have miracle working power like he does. He said, be like Jesus. He said, I want to be like Jesus, but I'm not Jesus. And you're not Jesus. You see, Jesus' healing ministry gave validation of his identity as the Son of God. Because only the Son of God can heal all sicknesses and all disease with a word or with a touch. And Jesus did it all the time. Only the Son of God can command demons to shut up and get out and they will obey. Only the Son of God can forgive sins. The sickness of the human soul. That's what really got him in trouble with the religious leaders. And called him a blasphemer when he started to forgive sins. Only the Son of God can raise the dead back to life. And so how was all of this possible? Right? That's, the, that's a valid question. How was he able to do all these things? Because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That's how. That's how all this happened. That's why it happened. Because the kingdom of heaven was with them. Now before we say we can't do the things that Jesus did and we try to you know, make our reasons why we can't be as, as helpful to people as Jesus was, 
We may not be able to perform miracles like Jesus did, but we might be might just be the miracle that someone is looking for in their time of need. Mm -hmm. How many times you help someone and they was oh God, thank God that you're here. Amen. I, was, I I didn't know what I was going to do, and here you are. How did you know this? How did you know that I needed this today? Right, a phone call, a text, or whatever it might be. When we bring healing, when we bring healing, when we're able to give people hope in the midst of hopelessness, when we bring healing, we bring healing when we're willing to mourn with those who are mourning. We bring healing when we intercede for others in prayer. We bring healing when we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We bring healing when we do good for others and expect nothing in return. You see, we bring healing. Right? The, the church is about bringing healing to a lost and dying world, a hurting world. Matthew 5, 16 says this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How do we bring light to the darkness? We let our light shine. We let our light shine, that's how. The ministers of the kingdom are all geared towards accomplishing the mission of the kingdom. And we do that by reaching people through the teaching, preaching, and healing ministries of the local church. Amen? Amen? That's how this happens. That's how God has designed this to work. So this morning as we close, we think about Jesus. And when he walked the earth, he was telling everyone to repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was saying this because he was there with them. Bodily, he was there. The kingdom was there. And when Jesus completed his mission to bring, it, to bring light to the darkness and atone for the sins of the world after his resurrection, he ascended back into his kingdom. That's where he's at now, that he sits at the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for us. But guess what? He's coming back. That's right. He is coming back. He is coming back someday. The kingdom is coming. Amen? Amen? Getting closer and closer with each and every passing minute, each and every passing hour, each and every passing week. Right? We know that he is coming back. And he's coming back for his people, kingdom people. That's who he's coming back for. He comforted his disciples with these words before his arrest and crucifixion. John 14, 1, 1 through 3. He told them, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If, they, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming again, church. That's right. He's coming again. My question for you is, are you ready for him to come back? Are you ready? If you've repented of your sins and you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're ready. If you haven't repented of your sins and you have not placed your faith in Jesus, you're not ready. That's right. But the good news is you can be made ready today. Amen. You can be made ready today. Place your faith in Jesus. Turn from your sins. Turn away from your sins. Don't just feel bad about your sins because you got caught. That's what happens a lot of times. I feel bad. I'm sorry. Repentance is more than saying you're sorry. That's right. It's stopping. It's stopping and turning away from those wicked things, the things that condemned you, the things that sent Jesus to the cross. Stop. Turn from those things. But as you turn from those things, you must turn to Christ. So that's my invitation for you this morning. If you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus, if you're not ready for the kingdom to come, get ready today. Place your faith in Jesus and get ready. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. God, we thank you for your word. What a, what a timely passage. Father, we are living in some, some wild Time, some chaotic times, some, some confusing times. So, Father, we don't want to be consumed with 
concern about uh, what's happening next or what is, you know, how bad things are going to get or this, that, and the other, as we often do. Father, help us to, to, to look to your word, to believe what your word says. Your, your word has promised. You have told us that, that the kingdom is coming. Jesus prayed, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, I pray that the promise of your coming kingdom would sustain us, would encourage us, would give us the, 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 uh, the, the, the will to press on, to endure, to persevere, whatever happens in these coming days, that we have this so certain hope that is in Christ. Father, thank you for the promise of the kingdom. Thank you for the, the message of the kingdom. Thank you for the, the mission of the kingdom, the, 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 the messengers for allowing us to serve and be your messengers. We thank you for the opportunity to serve in all the ministries that you have given us to help us to reach a lost and hurting and dying world, to point them to Jesus, to invite them into your kingdom. God, I pray this morning if there be any amongst us that have not yet believed in Jesus, that have not yet turned from their sins and turned to Jesus, that today would be the day. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the clarity of your word this morning. Mm -hmm. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.